Hey, Lauren, uh, can you tell me what life was like before you met Jesus? Absolutely. So um, I was raised in a Christian home. My dad accepted Jesus um, when I was four. So from that point on, it was very much um, part of the household, kind of, you know, going to church and all of that. Um, I went to a Christian high school. So I would say I was very much brought up in the Christian world. Um, but I don't know that I really knew what it felt like to have a personal relationship with Jesus. Um, I, I was yearning for that, especially in high school. Um, but going to a Christian school, you kind of become a little bit, I think, maybe numb to it a little bit. Um, so once I graduated high school and started, you know, getting into early adulthood, 1920s, um, that's when I realized that I needed a personal relationship with Jesus. Um, and that's kind of a longer story. Well, we have time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, I think God brings us to places in our lives where he, he knows what we need and he knows what our next step needs to be. And I feel that God kind of brought me to a spot where he was like, okay, you're about to be completely helpless, can't do anything for yourself, and I'm about to show you how big and how good I am and what a relationship with me is going to look like. And it kind of set the foundation for the rest, for the rest of you know, my life up to this point. Um, so when I was 19, um, I was diagnosed with a panic disorder and I would have a couple of panic attacks a day. It got to the point where I couldn't leave the house. Um, so for three months, I was in the house. Didn't know, you know, you're 19, it's scary. Yeah, you were, you, were you diagnosed with agoraphobia? No, um, not to that extreme, um, but it definitely, it felt like that. It definitely felt like that. Um, and for those three months, I really, um, I realized I could do nothing for myself and I was helpless. And where do you turn in that, in that situation? And I turned to God, you know, praise Jesus. And for three months, I was like, okay, what, what is my life gonna look like from here on out? Because I don't know how to pull myself out of this. And God gave me words to write songs. He gave me words to write poetry. Um, I dug into his word, um, just really, you know, giving my, my whole heart to him in a way that I never had before. And he set me free. And looking back now, I realized that if I hadn't gone through that, you know, that dark, dark place, I wouldn't have the relationship with Jesus that I have today. So I'm, I'm grateful for it, grateful for the darkness because it brought me to the ultimate light, which is Jesus. Thomas, you were talking about a dark place. Are you able to talk about that here today? Oh yeah, abs absolutely. Um, when I was in, in grad school, um, when I moved to the United States in, in 2014, um, I went through a period where I, I went through some, some pretty hard times um, I, I questioned my faith. I, I questioned what I believed in. Um, life did not make sense to me. Did you get angry a lot? Oh yeah, angry with, with God. I, I questioned Him. Um, I, I went through a phase where I couldn't hear His voice. And I was very used to hearing His voice. Um, after you know, I gave my life to Jesus, and I knew what it meant to, um, to you know, be in, in a true relationship with him. I, I was in tune to hearing his voice, but I, I just went through that period of, of testing and, and trials where I just couldn't hear from him. And, um, and, and I, I realized that that was a result of my pride, and that was a result of uh, of just my unbelief and and my lack of faith in him and I went down um, the the road of um, 
of, of learning about you know where we come from went went down the path of of exploring science exploring what's out there but it still didn't satisfy me i was still very like curious to learn more about where we come from and um it it came to a turning point when when i came across the book the purpose driven life and that's when it, it started to make sense to me some more. It, it started to um, make me realize that life's not about me. It's about what what God has in store for me. And and I started to um, renew my faith in Him again after I started reading the words in that book. It's it's really about developing your faith and. And, and growing in your relationship with him. And that's that's what really brought me around. Um, and I, I can I can say for a for a fact now that you know I, I need to rely on my God and I'm so used to relying on my own strength and my own abilities to get through tough times. But through those through those difficult times in, in graduate school, God showed me um, to learn to rely on Him and learn to trust in His abilities and not and not my own, and to to learn to trust in um, in His strength to get me through those hard times. This might be too personal, but do you ever have times now when you you still struggle with this? Absolutely, I, I do. Um, I, I do I do struggle with with my um, with, with with my faith. Um, but it's it's a good thing. It's it's questions um, that that I've got to ask um, whenever I go through like like troubling times. I do know that my God's there with me. Um, I, I do know He's He's around. He's He's never going to leave us. He's never going to forsake us. But I've, I'm still like a work in progress. My I faith <laughs> is my faith is growing. And if if someone's like going through. Um, a, a tough time where they, they, they're trusting or they're having a difficult time not trusting God, right? And going through a phase where they just can't um, find reason to, to believe. That's okay. God, God wants you as you are. Um, he, doesn't, he doesn't want a facade. You don't need to um, be all nice and tidy before coming to Him. He, he wants you to be real. He wants you to be honest, um, and he wants you to be yourself when you come to him, and that's that's what really um, changed me as I as I went through those those trialing um, periods in my life. I'm so glad. I think it's it's interesting. I, like the theme that I'm sensing like so far is that you know these dark places is where God shows up for us in really big ways, and I think. Um, me personally, and I'm sure a lot of people can relate, that we wonder why do we go through these dark periods, you know, these periods of trial. And like you said, um, going through those trials is where you connected with God the most, yeah. you know, and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't me growing up in a very comfortable Christian home environment. That's not where I connected with God the most. It was in, you know, the darkest point in my life. I just think that's interesting. Would you relate to that at all, Patrick? Absolutely. You have to keep in mind that I'm quite a bit older than you guys, so, and I only became a Christian at the age of 63. So I had a lot of time to pile up a lot of sins and, uh, and do a lot of things that I regret. But I, I do remember what life was like before I found Jesus, what I thought it was like. I was living in a dream world, really. Uh, my ego was definitely out of control. I didn't think anything at all of spending $5,000 on a suit or $300 on a bottle of wine, uh, lavish vacations, expensive toys, expensive cars, and so on. And it wasn't until I actually, just in the last couple of years that I've really been thinking back on it a lot, that I finally was able to pinpoint when I, when I reached my pinnacle of self-indulgence and egotism was uh, lying by a swimming pool in Las Vegas at Caesar's Palace with a friend of mine named John. 
And I still am embarrassed when I think of what I said, but I had the audacity to say, I wonder what poor people are doing right now. And the minute those words came out of my mouth, I knew they were wrong. But then we switched to another conversation. Now that I found Jesus, and I think about that, it, it actually makes me want to cry. That it was such a heartless thing to say, and, and I just thank God that that's not me anymore. But you know, growing up, I always wanted to fit in. I grew up in the 50s and 60s. And back then, if you weren't an athlete, you were nobody. And I was not born with great athletic talent. Um, and I always wanted to, to compete. You know, the athletes always dated the prettiest girls. I was too shy to date anyhow, so what difference would it make? I went on two <laughs> dates the whole time I was in high school. Um, but I never fit in. And that's one of the reasons I'm so thankful now. And later on, if, if you want me to, I'll tell you my testimony, how I came to Jesus. Uh, but I don't want to dominate this conversation, but I'm so thankful now because now for the first time I do fit in and yeah. I know it and I'm surrounded by people I love with a passion. What about you? Just Lisa? talking about what Lauren was saying that we we meet God in when we are in a mess, you know, mm -hmm. so that we can be a message. Um, I think that was true even for me. I was um, complacent. I was like, I was happy where I was. I, I did not really felt that I needed God at that point until He got my attention. Mm -hmm. And when I was going through that rough patch in my life, that's when I knew um, that God was trying to get my attention. But I was like, I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready. But He, he was like so good and he, he even provided for me. He gave me, he blessed me even when I didn't deserve um, his love. And those things when you see, you just cannot like deny, you know, once you've experienced the love of God, you just cannot like go back. And once you've seen, um, you know, miracles and you've seen things in your life, I think, um, I think that's how sometimes God gets our attention is not through in the happy times, but when we are going through these rough times in our life. So did you come out of the rough times consciously through doing certain things or were there people involved that helped you come out of that or did it just happen slowly over time? For me, it was over time. Um, I was not ready to give my life to Jesus. So I grew up Catholic and mm -hmm. um, my parents were, they were, they taught us how to pray and they were like really um, good Christians. Um, but my, you know, my heart wasn't in it. I always knew that, um, you know, it was more of a tradition for me. Prayer or even going to church was just like a tradition. Like Lauren said, I wouldn't, I wasn't in it. Um, I knew God with my mind, but I did not know him with my heart. Um, I knew that I did not want anything to do with God because I, um, so talking about um, how God got my attention, it was, there were many people that God also sent that who were also a part of, you know, that plan that God had. Uh, but it was mostly my brother who, you know, he just loved God. He loved God with all his heart. And um, I think that was one of the reasons um, looking at his faith was like the driving factor for me and his like he he was um, he kept um, inviting me like you know he kept inviting me to church and I think his faith is what like um, helped me in my relationship with God and but it was of course God who um, who was working in my heart and transforming my heart um, but he uses people around us like our pastors mm -hmm. are uh, all the people in our connect groups to help us, you know, um, get closer to him. So, yeah, it was, it was good. I have an uncanny ability, that's gonna sound weird to you, yeah. to control my blood pressure and my pulse. The doctors are amazed by it. They'll go to take my blood pressure and I'll tell them, how's 118 over 78 sound? And they go, what? <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna make it 118 over 78. And it'll be very close to that. It won't be exactly. I'll be to like 119 over 79 or whatever. They're like, is it always like that? I said, no, I just did that for you. But the reason I'm telling you this is I was raised Catholic also. And I didn't know this as a little kid. 
it was right in Sharon, uh, St. Joseph's, where I went to elementary school. But I would faint in church to get out of church. So my, and I, I can remember the sound that would bring me out. It was my head hitting the wooden pew and my dad would carry me out. And I did this on a regular basis just to get out of church. And I was a little kid, real little, like maybe five, six. So, so you could check your pulse. I had, I developed a very, yeah, <laughs> I developed a very serious resentment of the Catholic Church uh, when my mother passed away in 2013, which is the year I accepted Jesus, by the way. Wow. Um, and what I, led you to that moment? Well, what led me to accept Jesus uh, was my wife and my daughter. In 2013, my daughter and son-in-law, my only grandchild, came to visit from Colorado. And we had a week together, which I thought was a great week. And then I spoke to her a few days later, and uh, she said she cried all the way back to Colorado on the flight. And I said, why? She said, because you were so negative. I've never seen you that negative your whole life. And I was like, I wasn't negative. <laughs> So a few days later, a book arrives in the mail, The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel, that my daughter sent to me. My wife had been uh, a lover of Jesus from the time she was a little girl, and, uh, and she had gotten me watching Pastor Joe on Sundays. Uh, so I read this book. Uh, I, I'm, I, like, I like facts. I always have questions, maybe like you, Thomas. I wanna know, how do you know that? Can you prove that to me? So I read the book because I read the preface and I did a little research on it and I thought he was going to disprove the Bible in this book, which is what he set out to do. And when he did the exact opposite, I was shocked. I turned back and read the book a second time straight through and I fell to my knees. I started crying. I accepted Jesus uh, at that moment and I've never looked back. But it's taken me a long time since then. That was 2013. Like I said, I was 63 at the time. It's taken me until very recently here to start really feeling like I'm developing a close personal relationship with Jesus. And it's by learning how to pray. You know, if anybody asks me, I encounter, in my job, I encounter people all the time, every day. I go to people's homes to help them with various renovation projects, fences and decks and siding and roofs and so on. And I wear my cross out all the time because I'm very proud to be a follower of Jesus. Um, and I get into these conversations and, and people will, will start the conversation when they see the cross. And oftentimes they'll ask me questions about how they can be a better Christian or how they can get closer to Jesus. And what I, what I was taught by Pastor Graham before he left for Arizona was how to pray specifically. And then what I've learned more recently from some of the people at Believer's Church uh, is that you actually have to say the words out loud. You can't just think the prayer in your mind. Yes. And as a result, I'm being blessed every day. Left and right, I'll ask for something and I get it. And it's almost like magic. Uh, it's all good things, you know, I'm not asking for anything that God wouldn't approve of, but I'll, I'll, before I, I'll, I'll see a house that's a really poor house and I'll ask God, please let them find some way to be able to afford what I want to offer him today, today because their, their windows are broken. This isn't safe for children. And lo and behold, uh, God will find a way to make it happen. And I put a mezuzah up in my house. Do you all know what a mezuzah is? No. It's used in the Jewish faith. It has the, the prayer from Deuteronomy in it. Uh, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and all your strength. You shall speak to your children of it often. Uh, you shall speak of it when you wake in the morning and when you lie down at night, when you're traveling or when you're at home. You should even wear the what they call the tefillin. This is in the Jewish traditional faith. These little leather boxes they wear on their left hand, or on their head, I mean, and on their, on their left arm with the prayer inside. But basically, it's to remind you to talk to God all the time. And so you hang it on your doorpost. It, it closes the prayer of the Shema by saying, inscribe these words on the doorpost of your gate. And so I have it where I most often come in and out of my home, and I kiss my fingers, and I touch it, and I thank God for protecting my home while I'm going to be gone. And, protecting it while I was gone and just a reason to talk to God all the time. So just talking to God all the time and praying the right way has made a big difference for me. Wow, that's awesome. So as as you've grown as a Christian, right, since you've been 63 now, what's what's that process been like for you as, as you've grown your faith and as um, you've grown as a new believer? 
I felt very uncomfortable at first. <clears throat> I remember coming to Believer's Church for the first time, standing in the back. It, was, it wasn't in the current building, it was in the, old, in the same building, but in a different part. And uh, I didn't sing along with the music. I didn't know the music. Uh, and then when I kept coming, even though I did know the music, I would sing along, but I would never think about raising my hands or doing anything overt because I felt everybody would be watching me and I was very paranoid about it. Uh, this went on for a little while, but then gradually, and, and I wouldn't talk to people about my faith. I was wearing the cross. My wife gave me this, but I've never taken it off since she gave it to me. Uh, but I wouldn't talk to people about it. Uh, my thinking was, who am I to talk to other people about faith? I was a sinner for so many years and there are so many things I regret till I've come to realize that I'm exactly the kind of person that Jesus wants to be out there talking to others because we can relate. And uh, so it was difficult at first, but it's just a very gradual process. It's a journey. You mentioned earlier that your, your belief is a journey. And the thing to remember on a journey for Jesus is not the destination. That's not the goal. The journey is who you bring along with you as you're going. I believe, you know, our our relationship with Jesus is not like a one-time thing. Right. Like we have to nourish it. We have to work towards it. We have to fight for it. Fight for our faith. Mm. Um, even when you don't know what's happening, you know, in your life, you're praying about things. You don't know why some things are not changing. Right. But um, you know. One thing that I've realized through all this is that He is God, He is sovereign, and He He knows what's best for your life. He knows what's best. Um, so just learning to trust God is, is, is a process. Like it's, it's not just happens overnight. It's a process to trust God, even through your hard times and um, your um, happy times and in, you know, in your hard times to just learn to trust God. So, How do you guys deal with some of the things you see going on in the world that are so terrible? How do you deal with that in your faith? Very good question. Um, when, when I was going through those, uh, the, those difficult times in, in graduate school and I was questioning my faith, um, I used to ask God those same questions as well. You know, why, why are these people these kids dying why why are these people fighting why are these wars going around the world right what's why why would innocent kids die what is the main reason for that and and in my journey um as i've, I've grown with christ i've realized that god is a sovereign god right he makes he, he, he decides what happens, when it happens, how it happens. He, he knows the beginning and the end. Suffering is a part of life, right? And who are we to question his ways when, when we can't fathom, you know, his... his 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 wildest creations and the way he brought things to this world and it's 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 still an a, a very interesting topic to to discuss because it's it's a very touchy one um but that's what brings me peace because jesus has said in this world you are going to have troubles you are going to have trials you're going to have temptations but take heart, I have overcome the world. Yes. And you overcome by believing with what Jesus did on that cross, with the blood that he shed for us and the word of our testimony. And that's what can help us really become overcomers in Christ. And we can help encourage people to know the truth that some things are out of our control. We, we can't really control um, certain aspects of what happens in this world, but he's given us the ability to pray. He's, he's given us the ability to, to seek and to, um, and, and to learn more about him. And 
that's why he's given us the Holy Spirit as well, to have peace, yeah. to answer those questions. That's such an important word, peace. Because if yeah. you had to ask me what the biggest thing, maybe not the most important thing, but the most noticeable thing that I've gained by following Jesus is a peace within me I never had before. And it might be a function of age too, you know, as you're starting to, to reach the goal line, right. um, you realize the days are numbered yep. and that's okay. Do you ever have difficulty of believing that you're forgiven for all your sins? Um, yes. <laughs> I do too. I think that that is probably a struggle um, for a lot of a lot of people. Um, I mean, you you look at your life, the decisions that you've made. I'm the type of person who I would say my biggest struggle um, and I think I've gotten better with it as I've matured in my faith but believing that what like if I go through something if a trial comes upon me this is punishment for my sins this is you know I deserve this like uh, man I've messed up and you know <laughs> you know Take here it comes <laughs> you know um, but just and kind of looking at God like he was pointing his finger at me. And I think, again, as I've matured more in my faith and come to a better understanding that, yes, God, you know, he is truth. So he does recognize, you know, the good and evil in the world. And by sin, I mess up. I need to come before him and repent. But at the same time, he is equally love. And so he looks at me and he forgives me and that's it. You know, they're gone. Yep. And I'm the type of person I hang on to things. I do too. <laughs> and I will replay it and I'll be like, oh, I need to ask for forgiveness again and again and again. Um, but the beautiful thing about God is, I mean, he says he has separated those sins so far from us. Like he doesn't even, you know, see them anymore. Right, he chose not Such to remember. Such a non-human thing. Right. Someone sins against us, oh, we're taking notes, you know, we're keeping yeah. track. Yeah. And God erases it, you know, so. Alicia, what would you say to somebody who senses a need to develop a relationship with Jesus but just doesn't know how to go about doing it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the first thing is knowing that, that God loves you no matter what you've done in your past. And whatever people think about you, God loves you. He sees you. He hears you. He hears your prayers. He hears your cries. And he, I would encourage someone to just, you know, go to God, seek him. Um, even if it means like starting with like a small prayer, like, God, I need you. Mm -hmm. um, I don't understand everything, but I know you do. Um, just going to Him and with these small steps of faith, um, that's how I started. Um, it's not, it was like, uh, maybe it took me years, um, to be honest. Uh, it was not like some people have a 180 degree shift in their prayer life yeah. immediately, like after right. having an encounter with Jesus, but it wasn't the same with me. God had to keep knocking and keep trying <laughs> so I would say start with small steps of faith you take one step and God will take a million steps towards you mm -hmm. and he will oh he once you know experience the love of God you know you just you know I can tell you he he is so faithful he is so good um, you will not be disappointed you know once you are in a relationship with Jesus that's beautiful that is truly beautiful. What would you say to somebody about the need to go to a church, to be part of a church versus just believing on your own? Wow. Um, the need for fellowship is very real. Yes. And I keep going back to um, uh, to that instance in, in grad school when, when, when I was struggling with my faith. And the reason I was struggling is because I wasn't surrounded by by good Christian believers. You withdrew. Yeah. Um, exactly. I, I I wasn't willing to make that step to to stay connected. Um, and 
life was just so busy and it uh, you know god became the last priority oh, right. and the importance of fellowship is so important to make sure that your faith grows and your um your whole relationship with jesus also grows because you need to be deeply rooted right you, you need to go grow deep roots in order to in order to grow with your faith and if you don't have those deep roots um you're going to be you're blown away very easily where the the wind can come and and the rain may fall and you'll get washed away um just like um the the parable of the builders where when Jesus said um about you know building having the, the the wise man who built his house on the solid rocks he dug deep um and he you know it took some pain um it 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 was it's a, it was a, a longer process but he you know moved the sand away and built his house on the rock and having that strong foundation is so important to developing that um your faith with Jesus and really growing in your relationship with him and oftentimes i felt like the the foolish builder who has built his house on the sand right um and it it keeps going back to uh you two things um to me and that is how much faith you have and have you truly repented and i can say that um through many times in my life that i i really haven't understood what it really means to to truly repent um there's there's like the half-hearted repentance where you say oh god i'm sorry for what i've done but you keep going back and and doing the thing you've yeah. you've always been so used to doing kind of like what i get angry driving sure and sorry, i get god. angry driving too sorry i right? i didn't mean to get um, angry there yeah and <laughs> I think God is is called us to 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 keep taking those steps to truly repent and and keep going back to him in faith because that's how we grow um and and we need to stay connected as a church as a family to really grow in our faith because if you stay isolated you are bound to have questions yes. and you are bound to be blown away because God created us to to be yeah to be in fellowship to to have roots that are deeply connected with each other so you said family then and that that's so important that reminded me when when my children were young my wife and I wanted to expose them to many different kinds of religion so we took them to every kind of church you can think of methodist episcopalian lutheran presbyterian We both went to a Presbyterian college, Grove City, undergrad. But every place we went, we'd be in a conversation with people afterwards and they would find out we we're both professional musicians and it would always be will you conduct our choir for us? Will you accompany our uh, choir? Will you lead worship for us? And with two little children and it was never so we just kept pulling away. We would go to a church and we'd meet some people and we'd never go back again. But the biggest change for me now with Believers Church and i it's not me this is god working through everybody else that made me feel so welcome so a part of a new family that i told you before we sat down here that going to church feels like going to a family reunion every sunday yeah. and i and i'm looking forward to that yeah absolutely so. and i came from india and this was the first country that I'd like you know i lived for so long and you know leaving my parents behind and and I just came here the first place first place that I actually went to was believers church mm. after a few days after we um, arrived and I thought I would feel homesick and I would be like you know uh I would miss home but you know having when I just entered these doors people were smiling and you know mm. greeting you and um it's it's so much love like they knew you forever like right exactly right. <laughs> so true like family yeah there was like family and i am so glad that we have a church that stays connected i agree and i'm so glad to be part of your family yeah bring this together guys feels like we're family already we are <laughs> we are 
I know so many Christians who have walked away from the church and or who don't think that going to church is, you know, um, an important part of their walk with Jesus. And um, I think that's just so sad because, you know, whether they've had a bad experience in a church um, or they just don't want to connect for, you know, there's a variety of reasons why we don't want to connect with other people. Um, I mean, just not only the love and the fellowship and the family, but the accountability too, I think, mm -hmm. to not only be able to go to people that you trust and who share your same faith and ask questions, but for them to come to you and say, hey, like, are you doing X, Y, Z? Like, how are you in your walk? How is, you know, how is your faith growing right now? What are you walking through? And to kind of know, like, okay, I'm not alone and I can't drift too much because every week I'm checking in, you know, with these people who love Jesus as much as I do and who love me. Um, I think without that critical component, you can still have a relationship with Jesus. Um, but again, like you said, he's created us to be with each other and life is so hard and to be able to walk it with other Christians, um, I think it's a gift. I think one of the challenges we need to face and take on is to help people like that who walk away because they feel like they're just not good enough. Because when you walk into Believer's Church, the, everybody emanates this goodness that you just can't even, you can't even put into words. It's like every hand you shake, every person who, who you greet and, and, and with a smile, is, you're just surrounded by the best people you've ever been around in your whole life. And so I could see why somebody would be intimidated by that and think, well, these people are just too good for me. So what do you say to someone like that? We are not. not alone. <laughs> You're not alone. Um, yep. <laughs> we are imperfect human beings. And um, if, if I can fail so badly and God can still love me so much and he keeps wanting me to come back, even when I've turned my back on him, He's just been so faithful. He's always gonna keep pursuing you. He's always gonna keep running after you and he will never give up on you. I love how Alicia said, if you just take one small step toward I'll Jesus, he'll take a million, I take love a million that. steps toward you. That was powerful. Yeah. I'm gonna remember that. Aww. And yeah, just, I think being authentic mm -hmm. with one another and, you know, I think when you walk into Believers on a Sunday morning, what you're experiencing is joy. You know, people that actually want to be there, who actually, you know, believe in being there. Um, but there are people who are going through their own struggles. And you get into a connect group or you, you know, sit down and have coffee with someone, you're going to hear about those struggles and you're going to hear, you know, that authenticity, that work in progress. Um, it's not all buttoned up, tied together. You know, it's a work in progress. There, there's a group of guys that always sits in the same place, volunteers, and we, and some of them are close to my age, and we talk about things going on in the world right now, not like Pollyanna, not like everything is beautiful, <laughs> and we talk about reality, what's going on. But you can hear in their, in what they say and how they act that there is still this, this essence of goodness, yeah. and honesty, and love. That they're projecting. I think so. going back to um, this is going back a little bit, but how you were talking about the things that are going on in this world, um, they're so huge and yes. so serious and mm -hmm. so devastating. And I mean, that is, if any question I've gotten from people who are seeking, it's why. Why is why is God allowing this to happen? And as a non-believer, that, that is a hard question to answer because where do you put your faith? As a believer, I struggle with it and I have had to basically let go and say, if I believe in God, I believe in God 100%. I believe everything He says is true and I believe that His ways are so much higher like you were saying. Right. And that I don't have the answer to that. I wonder if maybe we need to lead them to scripture. Yep. If you go back to the time of the Israelites leaving Egypt, 
And God provided food and water when there was none and performed one miracle after another. I think there has to be a certain dedication to reading the scripture and reading God's word. Absolutely. To help bring you to that level of trust. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean that's the only that's the only way you you know, you look at one part of scripture and you believe it. You have to believe everything that God says, you know. I didn't believe the Bible was true until I read Lee Strobel's book. I thought it was all made up by men for their own purposes. Yeah. And if you don't believe the Bible's true, you really can't believe in Jesus as right. the Son of God. Right. I always thought he was a really good guy. He was full of love and, and somebody I definitely would like to hang out with, you know. But he was just a guy, maybe maybe a zealot. But the one requires the other. And so that's one thing I'll bet new Christians have a hard time with, or people who are, are questioning their faith, is dedicating the time to reading the Bible. Yeah. I know I don't read the Bible as much as I should, but I struggle with I, it as I well. heard a pastor two weeks ago, a rabbi, a, a Messianic rabbi, talk about the fact that it's not about how much you read the Bible. Uh, even the guest pastor last week talked about this. It's not about saying the rosary like you would in Catholics, you know. Say five Our Fathers and five Hail Marys and sin no more. And it's about love. It's about your commitment to Jesus and accepting his love and sharing his love with everybody around you. Yeah, and that's what Jesus des despised and he did not like the Pharisees. He said that you know, you say long prayers and you say a lot right. of things, but your hearts are so far away from God. Yes. Um, and that's what Jesus' message was the whole time. You know, you do everything outside, but you know, inside your heart is like so far away from God. And I think that was one of the main message that Jesus tried to, you know, preach during his ministry. So that was, for me, it was about understanding that God looks at your heart, like people look at your outer appearance, but God looks at your heart. And um, yeah, that was that was it. It doesn't matter, um, you know, what people think of you, where you've come from, or what you do for a living, which, where you live. Uh, well, yeah, what background you come from, what denomination you come from. <clears throat> all that God looks is your heart and your willingness to surrender and submit to him yeah so you hear a lot of talk about deconstructing faith these days how would you coach somebody on constructing a foundation for a life with jesus that's a very good question um when when i gave my life to jesus um, i didn't have like a 180 degree transformation as as a lot of people do it took time for me to um, build that trust and, and build that relationship with Jesus. And, um, and, and as I, I walked through that journey, um, I, was, I was still always a curious kid, even after you know, I gave my life to Jesus, always asking questions. Um, why are things specific ways? Um, why is the world just so evil and why why do things happen that that just cause so many problems and why do bad things happen all the time and why are people getting killed um, when they don't deserve to die and where are you God in all of this and um, I found that y you need to to stay really rooted in the word and, and that's extremely critical to, to starting off your journey as, as a Christian. So you can build on the Word. Exactly. And you need to build, you need to build your life on, on the truth, right? And, and if you have a shaky foundation, you're going to wither away. And I've walked through that myself. Um, you know, always having questions. I've, I've always been um, a doubting Thomas, as, as people say. Um, <laughs> But, but God's never um, uh, you know, turned his back on me. Even when I've got questions and um, even when I've, I've always um, you, you know, asked, asked God that, okay, you, you may not really be there in the situation, God. Um, I, I don't 
I don't feel you around here. Where are you when I'm going through the struggle? Why are you not with me? Um, I keep going back to the fact that you know, Satan wants you to feel that way. He wants you to feel that oh, alone. Yes. He he wants you to put you in a place where you feel that you are not loved by God, and 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 that's where um, it was. It was like an epiphany for me to realize that spiritual attacks are real, and 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 that Ephesians six twelve which states that. Um, you know, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but it is against the the rulers of this dark world, and it is against Satan. is is so important to, um, to to realizing that truth and fighting these battles, because if we don't realize that spiritual battles are real, we're gonna we're gonna probably fall away. Which is why you know I keep going back to. Um, building your foundation on the truth just like Jesus said um, in the parable of the builders where you need to build your, your house on the solid rock because if you do not you are going to fall away just like the person who, who built his house on the sand where the, the, the winds came, the rocks blew uh, not the rocks blew, what am I saying where the winds, the, the rain came and um, you, you just fell away from God so to, to a, a young Christian, someone who's new to the faith, yeah. would you say that by reading scripture, by turning to the truth and the word, that your foundation has gotten stronger and stronger and stronger incrementally? Can you feel yes, it? Yes, absolutely. Um, I've, I've always uh, struggled you know, to, um, to go into the word and, 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 and really put my, put my mind um, completely I'm, I'm probably phrasing this wrong I've I've always put my relationship on Jesus as the priority when I read the word because if you don't do that you're, you're kind of gonna get lost in the weeds and if you don't um, set your foundation um, and making reading your Bible a priority you're, you're gonna probably just fade away and uh, and if you don't read it with the intent of, of realizing that scripture is true, um, it, the word is not going to be as powerful as it, as it, as it could be in your life, which is, which is why it's so important. I don't know, Patrick, what are your thoughts there? Uh, I think that's terrific. I'm learning from you as I sit here. I'm going to go home and read my Bible. <laughs> I, I wish I could, I, I could like, read the Bible more myself. It's, it's, I've always realized that the enemy is going to do everything he can to keep you from reading the Bible and to keep you from reading the Word. And that's what I've realized that he's been doing in my life. He wants you to feel busy. He wants you to feel like, um, like yeah, you don't have time for God and God's not there for, for you. Right. And I think the biggest trick the enemy played on me was was making me believe that God did not exist by m making me go down that road of of questioning and um, you know exploring okay what what is science telling me about where we come from and it, it does not have all the answers science is not going to um, tell you exactly how it all began although you can you can probably go back in a certain point in time there is no way to know exactly where you came from, and it takes faith to um, to not believe as well. People say that okay, sure. I'm, I'm an atheist, but it it takes faith to, to be someone who doesn't believe. And you know, a true atheist probably has the strongest faith of anyone. Yeah, I I would agree. Faith to not believe. One of our guys at church said that to me a few weeks ago, and really rocked me back on my heels. Yeah, that was terrific. Thank you. Lauren, what would you say to, to a, a young Christian about why things aren't getting better? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, I talked a little bit about how walking through a dark point is what kind of led me to Jesus. And then once my relationship with Jesus, you know, I had kind of solidified it and built it. Um, the hope is that from then on out, everything's going to be easy. Right. Um, and unfortunately, it's just not the case. Um, 
the world that we live in um, is sin stained and um, suffering is part of living in this fallen world. And I would say that, um, Patrick, I think you said earlier, Jesus said that you're going to have suffering and you're going to have trials and struggles. Um, he tells us this, even if you have accepted Jesus, even if you are walking in a dedicated walk with him, it is not, um, it's not going to always look like the easiest path. But what's so beautiful is that when those trials do come up and when the world is beating you down, um, you have something that you are rooted in. You have something that you can um, persevere toward. Um, you have an end goal and you also have someone walking right alongside you um, for when those trials do come up. And so I would say to anyone who is in the middle of um, a trial or a very dark place and they're wondering, you know, I accepted Jesus, I'm in a relationship with Jesus, I'm doing X, Y, and Z, this shouldn't be happening. Um, I don't know why God always allows for the trials, but I do know that He's there with you in them and He will bring you that peace that we talked about yeah. and He will give you the strength to be able to endure through those trials. I've had conversations with people reminding them that the journey isn't a straight line. Yeah. If you're driving in Kansas, okay, you can drive <laughs> for three hours without ever moving the steering wheel. Uh, but that's not what life is like. Right. And I find I have to remind myself that when I slip, not in big ways, but little ways, we, we all slip, that I have to remind myself that, okay, I recognized it, I'm sorry for it, I'll try very hard not to do that again, but I'm forgiven. It's already been forgiven, God already knows my slips in the future, what I'm gonna do, and has already forgiven me for them. So I have to forgive myself and just be better. And when we become a Christian, we don't stop sinning either. Right, <laughs> you know? right. Like, we you, try. You, we try, um, you keep trying, you try to grow in holiness, you try to become more like Jesus, that, you know, sanctification process. Um, but, you know, you still fall, you still stumble. It's, it's um, no one is good, not even one. <laughs> just wanted to add to what yeah. Lauren said about peace yes that you know we'll have troubles and Jesus has also told us that he's given us peace yes um, you will have troubles in this world but you will but in him you will find peace and comfort um, so Jesus has already told us that I give you my peace my peace I give you yes. not as the world gives um, so your circumstances or the situation or the surroundings may not change but you will have the peace of God in you and that is what makes your life different from when you were yes. an unbeliever and that's what makes um, you know is the difference when we are Christians because we have the peace of God mm -hmm. that surpasses all understanding it does do you guys read the Bible together we do not actually. No, we, we read, read them this. separately. Yeah, we read them separately, but but oftentimes, yeah, she gives me um, a lot of encouragement from the scripture. That's great. Um, I read because, by candlelight. Oh, you read by candlelight? Mm -hmm. Because it kind of takes me back to the ancient times of the Israelites before there was electricity, and it just kind of puts me in that that proper perspective of obedience and humility and taking us out of the present world a little bit. You talked earlier about taking small steps mm -hmm. as you're growing your faith. How would, how would you encourage a new believer to take these small steps? I would say you can first go to God and, you know, seek Him. Like, these steps that I'm talking about is like, It's not like, it's not that it's going to happen. Things are going to change the moment, you know, you become a Christian, things are all going to be, um, be okay. You know, these steps that I'm talking about is like the little faith that you sow, the little faith like, God, I trust you in this situation. I don't know what's happening, but I trust you. And you know, when God comes through and you see the faithfulness of God and 
when you look back in, at your life and you'll be like god i don't know where i would be if you know you were not with me mm-hmm. right so it's these little things small things um in your life that keep you know and you see how god comes through every single time when you need him and um that's i think that's how we can build our trust in god um at least for me <laughs> you touched on something there because i i remember when i first accepted jesus yeah. that uh i had to remind myself frequently when i would encounter something where i would start to feel stress about it and like i should do something that i and i had other people encouraging me to do this to remind myself that no it's okay let's see where it goes let's see where god takes this yeah. instead of saying where am i going to take this So that's very powerful. Hey guys, I I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed this. It's been fantastic. Let's do it again sometime. Yeah, it's and it's been amazing. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Thank it you. Feels yeah, like guys. the family for sure. Absolutely. Thanks for the the amazing opportunity. Shalom. <laughs>